Hello and welcome to another episode of Esports Observed. I'm Chris Hanna and I'm joined by the one, the only, the great Mark Donovan. Hi, Mark. Hey, Chris. How's it going, buddy? Good. How are you? Good, good. Thanks. Look, I invited you to this because you're my go-to NFT, crypto, everything person, um, just following your work. And you gave me a really good um, support in helping me understand certain things like when I didn't. So what I want to do is I really want to talk to you about, you know, a little bit of uh, crypto, a little bit of, you know, what are NFTs and what you're doing. And I think that's what we should start with. And then we can do a build up. So Mark, First what, off, what, what do you for, do? Thanks for having me, uh, Chris. Always good to see your face. Um, I, hopefully we get to see each other in person at uh, one of your events again soon. I hope so. So what is it, what is it you do? Like, let's start with epics. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I always get questions from, from friends and family, like, or, or my wife does, like, what, what does Mark do? And it's always kind of a, an interesting question. Uh, I guess the, the way I would boil it down is, you know, we make collectibles for, you know, the kind of next generation of fans, uh, the people like us who, you know, um, you know, I grew up collecting trading cards and sports cards and, and things like that. And, you know, my business partner, Gavin, also did, but he's from the UK. So it's mostly like Panini sticker packs and stuff like that. I think that's bigger in Germany as well. Um, but uh, what we wanted to do is basically say, okay, the next generation of collectors, uh, what do they care about? What, what um, stars do they get excited about? Uh, what content do they get excited about? And, you know, we've been in the games and esports space for a long time. And, and that seemed like the, the natural thing to really build a collectibles company around. So when we started in 2017, uh, we basically built a platform to make unique digital collectibles around esports stars, gaming influencers, and you know the games that people are excited about. So we launched our uh, first collection for Counter Strike uh, in, I guess, summer of 2018, which is kind of crazy to think it was that long ago already. And uh, yeah, we've been building out ever since. We've got um, partnerships in place with some of the largest tournament organizers in the world, like ESL and DreamHack, uh, the largest game publisher in the world, Tencent. Uh, we partnered with them for PUBG Mobile uh, and some big influencers uh, as well and, and lots of other stuff kind of in the works uh, right now as well. I mean, I do collect stuff, so I totally get the, the collector's kind of vibe. Um, and I remember like us talking about all these things, like when you started and, you know, what what so he, and okay I gotta go back so here's here's my first question like okay why digital first like what made you what made you choose a digital product and why i'm asking this is because typically when you get a physical thing in your hands like if you have haptics you know you can touch something yep. it it almost feels like more valuable yep. so and you now have physical cards and we're going to get there but yep. what made you what made you start with digital cards why well, first and foremost, like, uh, I think that, um, you know, two reasons. Number one, you know, first, when you make a startup, you have to start somewhere, right? So um, digital is, is definitely the quickest way to get uh, out into market. Um, but number two, you know, we really believe in, and I think, you know, the, the investors that we have believe in, you know, the future of what people call like the metaverse, right? Um, the fact that people are going to spend more and more time in games and digital realities and things like that, um, we're firm believers in, in that future. So uh, we really do think that in the long run, um, you know, digital is going to end up being a, a bigger business and, and definitely um, more important to the consumer. So it's, you know, digital first, we thought was the most important thing to do um, from that perspective to make sure that in the future we're, you know, uh, the collectibles company of the future, not of the past, right? So, but we always did want to do uh, physical versions of the cards too. And I think the, the most important thing for us was to create a physical and digital offering that really um, was seamlessly integrated. Like today, if you go out and you cl do collector's cards um, from some other companies that have been in the market a while, uh, you know, you can buy the physical product, you can go to Walmart or Target and get physical product open it up and, and that's great. Like you said, you get the tactile feel, you can share it on social and get it graded by PSA and stuff like that, which is really cool. 
But what you can't do with those companies uh, is really show it off to a, a big community of like people from across the world. You can't really easily like trade it in an integrated market. And if you want to collect their digital uh, items, the two are not connected together, right? So what we wanted to do and what we have done is basically if you buy any of our physical cards, they're all unique uh, objects. So they all have a unique code that you can scan to unlock a digital item in our app. And that unlocks a, a whole bunch of really cool possibilities. So number one, you get the tactile feel, but you also get to you know put your low mint cards in a showcase and you get to show them off to you know all the people that use the app which is a lot of people from around the world you can start to use them in games so we have like our rush mini game so you can like use them to create an ultimate team compete against other people there's a whole bunch of different things that you unlock oh and leaderboards too so mm -hmm. we actually provide leaderboards for people to show off like i'm the number one collector of you know astralis cards or fanatic cards or, or whatever right so the digital aspect just allows so much more potential to engage and get more value out of the physical card that for us, it's just like everything had to kind of, kind of come together uh, in one product in order for us to do it. And we were willing to kind of wait for uh, the right kind of product to, to get out to market. Yeah, I was laughing about the leaderboard because um, initially I was on the thing and I was, yeah. I, was kind, I was not high up, but I was kind of there. And, you know, then lucky... You know, lucky for you, it's a it's a black hole for money. So I stopped buying your uh, cards. I'm sorry. I do have <laughs> I do have your first drop of physical cards. I still have yeah. it, but it's still wrapped. Like, and I'm not gonna okay. unpack, I'm not gonna unbox it. Like that, you know that that's what you do. But well, check check eBay because uh, <laughs> that that's a good strategy. I think they're going for about 10x retail now. Yeah, I can't like I can't open them. You know, it's like I have to. So they're in a box. They're stored somewhere. Same with my Overwatch League cards and all that stuff. Like it's it's just sealed somewhere lying around. But I totally, I totally understand um, what you're saying. And so I'm late to the magic party, right? I'm really late to all of the magic stuff that happened. But what I get sometimes annoyed with is, so I have a deck and I want to play the deck and now I want to play it in arena, like online, and I have to buy the fucking cards again. It's like, wait, I, I have them here, like physically, you know, I, I own yeah. these cards and they're kind of, sometimes they're expensive, as you know. It's like, yeah. I have it. Like, so why do I have to buy it now? And then there is no, there is no marketplace. I can't just buy the one card. Like I have to buy packs and then get wild cards so I can start to craft and it's a yep. black hole for money again. It's like good for them. Uh, sucks for yeah. me. So that, yeah, that's frustrating. It some, some of that's intentional, I think, of course. on, on some, some companies' parts. And I think some of it's unintentional as well. Um, like there are limitations, um, you know, like when, when we make our cards all unique, uh, you know, physical objects, you know, th there's special printing processes and stuff like that that need to be done. And, and like, I know this because our manufacturer actually manufactures the cards for Magic the Gathering. They were the first company that Wizards of the Coast actually flew over to Europe to, to find somebody that could actually do this type of card game for them. And so I understand, or I'm learning some of the intricacies of how this stuff gets done and the types of printers that are used and stuff. So I get why, you know, they don't have the integration there yet, but hopefully, you know, uh, Wizards gets there because here's a fun fact for you. It was actually the leading division for all of Hasbro last year. So they're, they're, uh, you know, a huge part of Hasbro's business now. Yeah. So I have a, I have a maybe stupid questions and then I'm going to, you know, ask you like a couple of stupid questions for sure. But here's, here's my, my thought around digital trading cards and, you know, we can stick to magic. If I have a really rare magic card, you know, let's say, I don't know, you go for Black Lotus, you know, Alpha, you know, there's a couple of them, people grade them, people store them away, all good. But then, I mean, there is a thought that there's going to be less and less, right? Because I don't know, some, some break them, some sell them, some just get lost. So if you have a pool of what thousand cards for whatever, and then, you know, over time, it, there's less cards. Yep. If you now have like your Epic cards, for example, right? I mean, how do you, how do you limit? And I mean, I look at physicals and, you know, I'm touching NFTs because let's say there is, there's a thousand cards of something and I own one, there's always going to be a thousand cards. You know, they're not, they're not going to go away. So how does that, you know, how does that compare like physical to digital? Yeah, I would, I would approach that from like two different um, points to that. So number one, um, just because it's digital and it can last forever, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it will. So if you take a look at Bitcoin, you know, the, the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, has, a, 
you know, let's say a million coins, right? There's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin and a million of them, let's say, are sitting in Satoshi's account or other people's accounts, right? That don't remember what their private keys were, that will never gain access. There's actually a famous story of a guy from the UK who threw some Bitcoin out on a hard drive. It's worth a couple hundred million dollars now and it's in a, a garbage dump somewhere. So, I mean, these digital objects uh, aren't necessarily all going to last forever. You know, people will lose uh, access to accounts and things like that. That's just the way it is. And those will, uh, you know, kind of fall out of circulation over time. And number two, you know, like especially what we see with our early seasons, like our founder season and stuff like that, um, you just have growth in the user base over time, right? So when you have a, a, a collection that's made for, let's say a thousand daily active users, you know, you try and create the number of items for that community that makes sense for that community. Now, when your day, DAU goes up to like a hundred thousand, those items are naturally going to become rarer and rarer. Number one, because, you know, some people aren't in the community anymore. They just turned out or they don't have their account information anymore. And number two, just because more people are demanding that uh, initial content. So it just increases with value over time. And that's definitely what we've seen uh, as we go along. I had this random person um, editing me on Steam <laughs> and trying, trying to um, buy cards off of me. Like, oh, yeah, are you that person on Epix? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like oh you have these two cards like can i have them no and then it's like i give you money so you know there's and it's not it's not look i'm i i would still have to work it's not that i you know all my yeah i don't know i can all my dreams can come true but it's like there was a person actually offer, offering me like real money to buy the cards um because i bought them early on right i bought the founders edition kind of stuff and collected yeah. that um and you know same thing like i store it away like it's on my mobile i'm not really like i'm using the app every now and then again yeah. but it's just, I just found that really interesting. And I see what you're saying. And I think you were the person um, that told me, right, when we talk about, um, and we're going to get there now, when we talk about, I don't know, you talk about NFTs and there's like, you know, video files or like JPEGs that people sell. I'm, I grew up with the internet. So if you give me like a physical something, I can understand, you know, it's a physical thing. It's one of a kind, whatever. But I had a really hard time initially to wrap my head around when you, you go for like take Neon Cat or whatever, like you have a JPEG or you have a GIF. And I'm like, okay, why do I need to own that? Because you can just copy paste it. And then you said like, yeah, but there's only one Mona Lisa and every can, everyone can get a reprint, but do you want to have a reprint or the one? And to me, like, it's, it's just so, and I don't know, maybe I'm just stupid or I'm just too old, man, but I had a, I had a hard time really wrapping my head around yeah. you know, that there actually is no real difference between physical and digital in that kind of sense. It's just, mm -hmm. to me, it felt so, like, it was just so used to, you know, you see something, you just share it. It's like, it almost seems like you own it or, or it's kind of, you don't need real ownership of a digital item. Like it's really hard to explain. So that's something that the more I read into this now, it just blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing how it works. I mean, there's, there's something hardwired into, you know, our brains that uh, flips a switch when you actually own something and when you don't own it. Right. It just, uh, for some reason, especially with certain people, you know, like the collector mindset, it, it, does provide a different level of satisfaction when yeah. you know you're the the record on that blockchain as the owner of that digital asset it makes a, a huge psychological difference so um how does blockchain play into everything you do with epics let's start with that like do you have cards on blockchain and i don't know maybe and you know if you can keep it kind of like can you just explain the mechanics of blockchain like in very brief terms Sure. So uh, a blockchain is basically a distributed database. So uh, as opposed to a, a database that's controlled by one company, like say Epix, it's a database that anyone can set up and run. Uh, and typically they have a currency associated with them. So basically everybody is uh, keeping a copy of the database. They're processing transactions as they come in and making sure that nobody has control over the entire uh, ecosystem. That's kind of a simple overview. What it allows it to do is basically gives everyone confidence that nobody's able to play games, like change records of ownership and things like that on anyone, uh, or block anyone's access to the network. So I can't say, Chris, you know, you can't access our network anymore and kick you off. You know, it's it's basically um, a decentralized system that's kind of permissionless for everyone to use. Um, now, that's got a lot of benefits, obviously. Um, 
you know, no one's controlling it. Uh, everyone can access it, which is great. Um, but it also comes with drawbacks on things like scalability, uh, on cost. So when we got started in 2017, um, you know, Ethereum was just becoming a big thing. Ethereum is one of the leading um, blockchains. It's actually, it allows people to build programs and digital objects on top of it. Uh, whereas Bitcoin is very much just transferring Bitcoin between users. Ethereum is more of like a distributed computer where you can build applications on top of it and, and you know, uh, create uh, code that transfers value between people, which is really cool and enables NFTs, obviously. Um, so basically, when we got started in 2017, Ethereum was just really, you know, hitting the market, right? Um, as far as scaling and things like that, you might remember CryptoKitties. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first kind of big scale NFT on, on Ethereum. And what it did was it essentially, you know, brought the whole network to its knees uh, because, you know, hundreds of thousands of people wanted to get these cats and we're breeding them and doing all that kind of stuff. And yeah, maybe, maybe and we should probably just briefly explain this, right? So you can own right. a kitty or you can own multiple kitties and you can breed new kitties. And we're, exactly. we're actually talking about kitties, right? We're talking about yeah, so like... Kitty cats, yes. Yeah. Uh, so basically, yeah, you could have them. They, they'd have traits based on who their parents were and the odds of getting certain traits. I mean, it's a genius, like little simple collectability game, right? Um, and that was by Dapper Labs, the guys who did Top Shot and stuff like that. They've done a very big things since. Um, but basically, it, it brought Ethereum to its knees because Ethereum was not ready to scale at that point. And you know, we'll get into you know some of the stuff that's been done since. Um, so when we got started in 2017, we very much believed in the in the technology and the future of blockchain, especially uh, as it relates to collectibles. But at that time, it was not ready for us to hit the scale that we wanted to our product to hit, right? Like we don't just want to serve the big whales who spend you know ten thousand dollars on an item. Um, we want to serve everybody, and we want to be able to give you know some stuff away for free and, and different stuff like that. Like it shouldn't cost ten thousand dollars to get into our ecosystem. So um, basically, what we did was we tried to kind of uh, offer the best of both worlds to people. So we built a centralized system that still has the same tracking of ownership, of uh, card history, of all that kind of stuff uh, for every single one of our uh, digital objects. And then we built a bridge to the Ethereum network. So any of our rarest items or any item that any collector on Epix wanted to, you can tokenize it on Ethereum and you can move it to your Ethereum wallet. You can sell it in any of the Ethereum marketplaces. You know, it's kind of a bridge there. If you're willing to spend a little bit of our in-game currency, you can take it into the Ethereum world if you want. So we have that. Um, and we, you know, things like our uh, digitally signed cards, uh, things like, you know, our rare midnight cards and stuff like that. Those are all, you know, tokenized on Ethereum because, you know, they're really valuable. And we want to make sure that they're, you know, secured and that collectors have them there. Um, and, you know, people do just, tokenize their items, sell them on OpenSea. And we've done some stuff with those guys in the, in the past as well. Um, so that was kind of the, the start that we made. Now, uh, Ethereum's come a long way um, since 2017. And you know, over the past four years, we've been evaluating every uh, scaling technology for Ethereum, the underlying scaling of Ethereum and all that kind of stuff. And we ended up, after talking to many different people, uh, finding a company called Immutable uh, and Immutable X, their, their platform. And what Immutable X is doing is it's actually building what's called a layer two on top of Ethereum. So yeah, I know this is, if I'm getting like two- No, it's like, like, I, no, no and, and we, we talked about this. So I, I kind of can follow you now, and we got, but you know, after that, we're going to go back to, I guess, more, I don't know, more, more basics. But I, I just think it's mind blowing to see, you know, all the stuff that has been built on this already and, you know, yeah. things that are built for it and, and how it just scales. It's so fast. And like we were just saying uh, before we, we got started recording too, it's moving so fast that even if you're, you know, kind of paying attention to it multiple hours a day and research and stuff, you can't even keep up with it. It just, it literally is moving so fast. Um, but this layer two tech is, is really interesting because um, Ethereum's big problem right now is that there's such demand for using it that the costs are very, very high. Um, so processing a transaction, you know, if I want to mint an NFT, that can cost me, 
you know, fifty dollars, it can cost me over a hundred dollars if the network is really, really congested. So, what Immutable and other Layer Two technology is doing is it's taking those transactions off of the main Ethereum network and it's taking them into like a, a Layer Two where you can do you know up to a million transactions and you can bundle them all into one small transaction and put that on the Ethereum network. Now, what that does obviously is it reduces the costs because you're doing these all uh, like a, as a side batch. So you can essentially pay $0 for minting instead of 50 or $100, which is obviously a game changer um, when you're you several orders of magnitude uh, less costs. So you can start to deal with the scale that we have, right? So we can actually take our 150 million unique digital objects and we can put them all onto Ethereum using this type of technology. So it's a game changer. Um, so we're doing that integration right now in our first test, which I think you said you wanted to talk about uh, is our collective product. Yep. So um, that's kind of maybe a segue into discussing that at some point, but. Um, yeah, let me, let, me just, let me just stop you right there, man. Like we're yeah. gonna talk about this, but just to go really back to kind of basics, like what's an NFT? In, in the simplest right. terms, what is an NFT? So an NFT is, it's a very broad concept. Um, so maybe it's, it's useful to describe it as uh, compared to a cryptocurrency, right? So one Bitcoin is the same as every other Bitcoin, right? I can exchange one Bitcoin for another Bitcoin. It doesn't matter to me because I can use them both for the same purposes. Now, that's what's called a fungible token. So fungible just means exchangeable, same yep. as, uh, as the other one. Now, an NFT is a non-fungible token. So it means that each token that you're making is unique. Uh, it's uh, individually tracked. It has different characteristics than every other one. So that obviously lends itself to collectibles um, because every single you know, baseball card, you can make that a unique digital baseball card, right? Which is, which is a really cool concept. Uh, and you can track that across the network. You can also use it for a million other things. You can make a concert ticket, an NFT. You can make the deed to your house, an NFT as well. It just means that every single one is unique and uh, individual and not tradable for anything else. Uh, well, it could be tradable, but it's not fungible or interchangeable for anything else. So let, let's go back to the kitties um, we, we just talked about. So each kitty is an NFT. So it's a, it's a unique kitten right? That I own and I can breed more unique kittens, but what do I actually own? Like, you know, because, and I like, I, I found the, the coolest tweet I read about this is like, you know, NFTs feel like money laundering by selling JPEGs. And, and I just felt like, you know, oh yeah, holy shit, you know, it's, and I'm not saying anyone's doing this, but like in the end, I mean, you're, and you, you know, we talked about attributes, but you're, you're putting, like you're really turning like a JPEG or a GIF or a video file or these kind of things, or you can mm -hmm. put these up as an NFT. And then that becomes a unique thing that I own. Right. And, but, but I basically own the rights to the image, for example, right? Right. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of different like layers yeah. of copyright law and all this kind of stuff, but at its, its simplest um, format, yeah, you, you're, you're getting ownership um, that's provable uh, over that asset. So um, essentially like an NFT uh, introduces the concept of a blockchain, right? So that is the immutable ownership record of that yeah. item is really what you're, what you're paying for. Um, and it's to get that proof um, that that Nyan cat is, is Chris's. Yeah. And if you want to, that also gives you the ability to sell that ownership, right? So it introduces a level of, of commerce into uh, digital collecting that, you know, really hasn't uh, existed a lot in the past. CSGO skins ecosystem, right? So in-game items obviously have value, right? Um, to own that in the game accrues a certain amount of value because it gives you status or it gives you, you know, yep. some unique ability in the game or something like that. But with Counter-Strike skins, uh, it's really interesting to look at the ownership aspect of that because you, you don't essentially own your Counter-Strike item. Valve gives you an API to move them from person to person, but it very much according to the terms of service, they're Valve's items and you're getting um, the ability to use them. So some Counter-Strike skins sell for 
hundred and fifty thousand uh, for. Like I, I read that. I read that recently. Yeah. So and and like we we used to have an auction site for Counter Strike skins, right? So we saw like how much uh, some of these things were worth. Um, but at the end of the day, like and, and companies who would run like an auction site or something like that would run into this all the time, where Valve would ban uh, mm-hmm. you know an account and potentially your $150,000 item is gone. And you've probably dealt with Valve customer support before, but it's, uh, you know, you have very little, let's say you have very little recourse for actually getting your item back. And so that's a, that's, it's a very important aspect to these digital items is to actually have that ownership record and to have that, that value, um, you know, locked in, in your uh, account versus a game publishers or, you know, marketplaces or anything like that. It's your item. Mm -hmm. And even though it's just a JPEG somewhere, uh, you have the ownership right and you have the ability to sell it. So that's a, it's a pretty big game changer, I think, in collectibles as well. Yeah. So it's mainly, um, and I just, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm really reading a lot into this right now, but just to then briefly summarize this, it's really about ownership. It's about provable ownership that, you know, I own this item. Um, and that's why art, when you look at digital art, I mean, right now, and I mean, we're talking about this because there is so much content around it, but you can't get around NFTs anywhere. Like everyone's doing something and everyone's kind of, you know, minting, creating these kind of NFTs right now about like really everything. Like I've seen, I've seen pretty much everything on any trading platforms, so it's crazy. Um, so now walk me through collective because that's, that's art that's you know nf that's based on nfts so what are you doing with collective yeah so collective um like i said we've we've got um uh, this new project that we want to do because we want um eventually to have every single one of our items on on the blockchain and we want to hit that scale so in order to get there we need to take a couple of steps right because the last thing we want to do is do a whole bunch of experimentation with the stuff that our collectors take very seriously. They're, they're digital objects, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there's collectors that we have within Epics that have over a million items in their collection. So they're very serious about this stuff. Um, so we wanted to basically create a new um, sandbox or playground that we could actually start to uh, push the ball forward on, on this stuff. So Collective was basically a concept we came up with and uh, we partnered up with a bunch of leading NFT artists, including like guys that sell their pieces for, you know, a million dollars plus like X. And let me, let me just, let me just ask you, like when you're talking about an NFT artist, we're talking about a person who draws a digital image, right? Can be, can be pixelated, can be a video, can be some 3D rendering. Like that's, that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. It's, it's art, right? I mean, what is yeah. art? Art, art can be yeah. pretty much anything. Um, you know, it can be Andy Warhol taking a you know picture of a Campbell soup can, or yeah. you know, like it does doesn't really it, it it's defined by the artist and yeah. whatever people uh, want to collect. So um, basically, yeah, NFT art can be literally anything um, that you can possibly imagine. Some people have done really cool like uh, 3D rendered animations. People have done like uh, game scenes and stuff like that, and like the the uh spectrum is endless like people mm-hmm. will create um an infinite number of, of types of combinations of nft art but what we did was we went out and said you know what do we do well we make uh, collector cards right and we do a pretty good job of like creating these types of sets and we partnered with uh, the crypto artists to create a collection that's basically you know uh, about the top people uh, projects and crypto artists from the entire like uh, NFT scene uh, and the entire crypto ecosystem. And we decided to do a yearly set. So for crypto 2021, it's the people and the projects and the artists that have made an impact over the past year. And we're also we're commerce that we've sourced um, and that the NFT artists have brought to us. And we're actually like helping to kind of break them onto the scene as well. Um, so we created this 100 card set um, and we just basically launched the presale uh, a few weeks ago and the site will go live uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, and it'll be our first implementation on Immutable X. We're one of the first projects to be releasing on it. So we're helping to kind of, you know, pioneer and push the ball forward in the Ethereum development ecosystem. And yeah, we're just super excited to kind of see how it goes. And we've got a lot of plans uh, in the future for that as well. 
Yeah, and I'm, you know, I really want to make this clear. I'm in no way trying to talk this down. Like, even when I say, you know, oh, we're talking about JPEGs because, yeah. and I still listen to 8-bit music, you know, made from Game Boys. And I think some of the covers of the, well, of the singles, if you want so, they're art yeah. and they're like yeah. pixel art. And yeah. I love that stuff. Um, I bought my first NFTs, like, because I was really trying to get my, you know, I wanted to wrap my head around this. Yeah. Um, what do you think has to, no, two questions, right? What do you think has to change in order to really um, go more mainstream? And I want to, you know, talk a little bit about the future yeah. and like, what are the, what are the challenges? Because I feel right now, as we said, everyone's doing something. So obviously, you know, some stuff might be valuable. Some might not be. A lot of people yeah. might lose money because everyone can just mint whatever they want. And I can put, I can put your picture up as an NFT. You know, we yeah. can, we can do an animation from this call and it's like an, an NFT. Yeah. Um, but I feel it's kind of, and I'm looking at technology, but I feel it's really, it's not user-friendly, you know? You got to go and buy some Ethereum, so you need a wallet, you need, you know, there's several steps you have to do just in order to be, to be ready to kind of buy stuff. Yeah. And so what's your, what's your take on where it is right now and, you know, where it's going? Yeah, I mean, uh, number one, right now, it's, it's too damn hard and it's too damn expensive. Um, so, you know, number one, uh, better wallets, better onboarding, that type of stuff is just, um, you know, uh, table stakes for, for hitting the mass market. And so I think a lot of that stuff is changing now. Like it's definitely a lot easier than it was in 2017 to, uh, to get some of these collectibles, um, like crypto punks. We were talking about that, uh, before we jumped on, you know, when, when crypto punks came out, um, you actually had to, you know, connect to their contract and claim the items. There wasn't even like a MetaMask wallet or anything you could use to just connect. You got to you gotta explain some of these phrases. Like you got to explain what this means because I think so, otherwise people will not be able to follow you. Oh man. Well, the, the NFTs are governed by these things called smart contracts, right? Which is the code that lives on the blockchain that says, you know, this is how you get one of these things, let's say. Yeah. So you would have to actually like be running your own um, Ethereum, you know, setup in order to like connect to that. There was no software you could use to just say, I want to go to this website and I want to get one of these things. You actually had to do some, you know, light coding or tap into the APIs and stuff like that. So uh, basically what's happened now is you have like a company called MetaMask or some of these other wallets where you just create an account there. And then every time you go to a website that deals with NFTs, you can connect to it just like you would sign in with Google or Facebook or some of these other, you know, uh, third-party services. So that's made it infinitely easier already to like get into this stuff. But in the future, you know, you really just want to have a normal account that you sign up with an email. You don't have to worry about, you know, seed phrases and private keys and all this stuff that we don't need to get into, but it's really complicated uh, for the average person. Um, you just sign up with your account and you have your items and you know that, you know, those are your items and, and you have the control to, you know, conduct commerce and stuff like that with them. Um, that's how easy it needs to get to hit like the next stream of mass adoption. And then on top of that, the costs obviously need to come down. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's happening now with, uh, you know, this layer two stuff and with, you know, uh, the types of user experiences that we're building. Um, that stuff's going to happen over the next year or two. And, and it's really, you know, like, we're still super early with NFTs. There's a big hype cycle going on right now. And I'm sure, yeah, like you said, the bubble at some point will, will come to an end and, you know, uh, people will find out how illiquid some of this stuff really is. And lots of people will unfortunately realize that some of these collectibles are not worth as much as they hoped they would be. But the whole point of collecting is you should collect stuff that you like and that you would keep through, you know, a, a bull market and a bear market. And just really, you know, focus on that stuff. Only buy that stuff, not the stuff that you think is going to be worth, you know, a million dollars in a year from now. So at the end of the day, this technology is going to change the world. That's a foregone conclusion. Like uh, NFTs will be a part of everyday life uh, within five to 10 years. And so whether the price goes up and then down, the adoption of the technology is just going to keep on going up. Um, and so there's going to be lots of hype cycles and down cycles and stuff, just like cryptocurrency in general. But at the end of the day, like NFTs are here to stay. Uh, if you're into games, this will absolutely change fundamentally the games industry, the way that uh, in-game economies are, are generated, the way that in-game items uh, are uh, you know, basically created, 
the way that value is transferred between games, interoperability between games, there's a huge new uh, sea change coming. And it'll probably be, you know, especially at the AAA game level, you know, we're three to five years away from seeing the first games um, that really leverage this. But trust me, every major game publisher is uh, looking at this and how it's going to change their business for sure. Yeah, I just found it's it's such a complex topic, and I'm not sure if even now when we talk about this, right? I mean, I I ask you stupid stuff. Like I'm reading I'm reading into some of this. I'm not sure if people can really follow like everything and the train of thoughts like I'm having and you're having in response. But I just feel like the more I read about it, it just blew my mind. You know, it's yeah. like, and I mean, I'm at a point now where I kind of feel I I kind of get it. You know, but then then there's so much more I learn oh, every day. Me. I, I every every day I feel like an idiot, and I'm just trying to absorb as much knowledge as I can because it's it, like you said. As soon as you fundamentally grasp, like the <laughs> the, the basics of it and how much it's going to change everything, you just get uh, addicted right away to to figure out like how you can take part in it. And I feel the same. The same applies to blockchain overall. And if you look at if you look at cutting out the middleman because there's nobody who can fuck you over, like yeah. I can come up with a gazillion ideas on where you can cut off a middleman because you know take mileage for a car imagine nobody can fuck you over because it's recorded every time you go to some garage and they record your mileage and you buy the car you know exactly what it ran like you know, it's Hell, just the, a basic the car everyday being example. recorded yeah not even any garage that can fuck with it <laughs> yeah so that's yeah. you know and that's like when I, the more i think about it like i can i can think about like a ton of these kind of use cases. So I think it's, it's fun, um, very complex. Mm -hmm. And now when you look at, specifically when you look at, you know, the NFT hype, um, I think it's sometimes really hard to grasp. And, you know, we're talking about, we talked about Ethereum, but then there's other, there's other kind of networks that also like, dude, like, I'm like, holy fuck, I'm, I'm out, you know, I just, I'm, I'm good with what I know right now. And I kind of, I kind of feel I'm, I'm getting the sense of it. And I feel like I understand what you can do with it, <laughs> but I also, truly believe that it's going to change like a lot of things and even even if it's not about just collecting things you know just the way you transfer ownership and you prove ownership and you know you prevent people from really getting messed with i think there's like such an immense potential it's crazy yeah. absolutely like even when i think about you know a perfect use case of concert tickets right um you know you hear about people who you know, when you get a printed out concert ticket, you don't know whether that's the, you know, the original printed out concert ticket. And somebody might have printed out 10 different versions of that concert ticket, passed out to 10 different people, made money off of them. And you only know when you show up at the front door of the concert and only the first person gets in, right? If that was an NFT, literally you could have it on your phone uh, and know for certain that that is the original NFT and that it's owned because the record is on chain. Like there's literally a million different applications for this. And for gaming, it's just like, it's absolutely going to be huge. Like imagine in an in-game economy and something like Warcraft, where you really could have a real in-game economy. And instead of, you know, Blizzard cracking down on the, the secondary market of people who want to create value for others in the game, it was supported and it was encouraged. Like it's, it's really going to fundamentally change things. And I think, uh, you know, we're just at the tip. Man, I've seen, so when I, when I did my initial research, I've seen these companies who create like fashion as, you know, NFT fashion, but it's really, it doesn't, I mean, and I'm, I'm going to say this in layman's terms again, it doesn't exist, right? You buy a digital item, they Photoshop the item onto you in a picture and then you kind of own the item. And I'm like, I, I mean, I get it. And even though, even though it sounds so weird, I still get it. So yeah. what I'm waiting for is I'm waiting for the time that I can that I can take my I don't know Louis Vuitton League of Legends jacket into Counter Strike like you know or whatever man I want to you know the sneakers I buy I can put them on my Fortnite or Counter Strike character right that's the kind of stuff I'm waiting for. Yeah, I mean like even when you look at the the metaverse right so you've got uh, projects like Decentraland where you know there's plots of land for sale in this digital world and people pay a lot for the plots that are right by where people spawn, right? Because obviously if they're there, and then literally they're putting billboards for advertising on these places, like they can monetize it. So yeah, you'll be able to wear your Louis Vuitton, you know, jacket from League of Legends in Decentraland, and you'll be able to show that off to people and you'll love it. And that will be, you know, worth it to you. And, and like the value generated for you from that is worth whatever you spent for that jacket. 
hopefully. But it's it's crazy, like the how things are just going to change over the next like five to ten years. I love it, and I love just seeing that kind of stuff. And um, I'm all, and you know, I know I'm already late to the party. So when I started reading into this, I know I'm like way too late to the party. But it's just, as I said, man, it just blew my mind. So yeah, I just I just you know wanted to get your opinion on a couple of things. Wanted to ask you some questions. Um, I think we can leave it here and just you know Great. dream dream about a perfect future. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sounds good, man. I'll see you in the metaverse. Thanks for making time and um, you know answering Cheers. questions and walking me through this. Of course. Talk soon, buddy. Bye bye. Cheers.